Hi, my name is Elaine Engelhart. I'm from Utah Valley University. I'm a distinguished professor of ethics and also a professor of philosophy. And I've been there for more than 40 years, and I've enjoyed teaching uh, in the field of ethics for about that same amount of time. I started working in ethics back in 1986 when my university was then a community college. And I wrote a grant to National Endowment for the Humanities asking them to help us fund an interdisciplinary course in ethics and values. And uh, they didn't know what to think about funding a technical college. Did we have enough dedication? Uh, could we really pull off a major humanities course like this? Well, it took three times to get the grant, but by the third time, uh, we were really ready to do this course with or without funding from NEH. But having the money, the name, the significance of National Endowment for the Humanities behind us was really important. And so at this uh, college then, we started having a core course in ethics that was interdisciplinary. It used the, the disciplines of philosophy, history, literature, and religion as vehicles for navigating through this very important topic of ethics. And I remember learning so much, and I still do, in every single class period with my students. And so um, I wanted to do more and uh, wrote another grant with uh, the, the National Endowment for U the Humanities. And then in 1992, I got a grant from FIPSI, the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, also with the Department of Education. And it was to do ethics across the curriculum. So no longer were we just having this one class by the way, all students at my college had to take this class before they could graduate, and it's still a core requirement for all students. So all students have this main conversation point of being able to discuss uh, thoroughly ethics issues. And so it, it's been a, um, sometimes a controversial thing to have this class because sometimes people think they, all, they know their ethics already. And there's, there's only one point of view, and there's one political party, and there's one religion, and we don't need to look beyond this. But we can see how important it is when we start challenging people to uh, look at their own basic uh, ideas and trying to expand them. So um, I received a grant to do ethics across the curriculum, and when I received that grant, I met Denny Elliott, and she had just also received a grant from FIPSI, and she said, hey, there's this new organization that's just starting, and it, it's called API, uh, the Association for Practical and Professional Ethics. I think you'd really like it. And Denny was absolutely right. Um, when I got to API, I found all these other interesting people who were as crazy about ethics as I was. I loved discussing ethics, and here I could network with so many other people who loved talking about ethics, who loved teaching ethics, and had ideas on pedagogy and scholarship, and it just seemed like the conversations went on and on. Um, as a person from a community college, uh, I was a little bit daunted because here there were people uh, like Dennis Thompson and Cicela Bach who were from Harvard. There was Pat Werhane who was from the University of Virginia. There was um, Amy Thompson, Amy Gutman, I mean, who was from Princeton. And uh, Bob Lowry from Case Western Reserve, so many outstanding people, and I think I was probably one of the only people from the community college, and they were all nice to me. And uh, I found that it was really a good place to do networking, and that um, in my own ethics program at Utah Valley University, which by the way is now 42,000 students uh, as compared to you know just a couple of thousand when I started there, um, we could invite a lot of these people to our campus as scholars in residence to share with faculty and also with students um, important aspects of ethics. So as part of my initial grant from National Endowment for the Humanities, 
we were always to have a summer seminar for our faculty, and it would be one to two weeks in length. And that has continued since 1986. Every year we've brought in a scholar of national reputation. And so we've had wonderful people such as Pat Warhane, uh, Michael Pritchard. I should mention that Michael Pritchard was one of the first people that I also met at uh, Appy. And uh, now we're married. We've been married uh, 11 uh, and a half years. So that's been another wonderful benefit. <laughs> we, we had both sadly lost our spouses to bad diseases, but had known each other at Appy and um, knew that we were quality people and that we shared a lot of similar interests. So that was a fun thing uh, to, to do there. Um, so many scholars that we have brought in, we got to know first at Appy and uh, could kind of vet them that way and then uh, have them uh, spend some time with us. Elaine, that, that's just a remarkable story. Thank you for sharing uh, all of that and those amazing uh, perspectives. I'm curious, since you've been teaching consistently through this period, what kinds of issues were on the table in your classes under discussion early on? What sorts of discussions do you have today? Is there a through line with respect to the issues? Or are they dramatically changing? Comment. You know, there are some issues within the field of ethics that I like discussing with my students, that I like discussing with colleagues. I find that the issue of war and nuclear war is not uh, a subject that the students really focus on. They feel like that um, if it happens, it happens and I'm gone. And they don't really think about, are there ways that we can peacefully prevent this? Are there ways that we can work through not having as many nuclear weapons? And if we're not talking about it, then perhaps we should be finding better ways to talk about it rather than saying, how did all this funding go through for more and more nuclear weapons? So that's an issue that I've been discussing with my students from the beginning of the course. Other uh, issue that I've always enjoyed discussing are business ethics issues. And starting with making sure they understand some of the fundamentals of business ethics from folks such as uh, Adam Smith and Karl Marx, you know, even uh, bringing in uh, Friedman and uh, then looking at some of the really strong issues. And once again, being guided by wonderful mentors such as uh, Patricia Warhane and Tom Donaldson and other people who have put out uh, outstanding books that help uh, faculty such as myself uh, introduce students to these very important issues. Um, I've also found that the great Civil War debate in, in uh, at least at my university has been the issue of abortion and sexual morality and I've never run away from that issue. It is an issue that I've taught since the beginning of this course in 1986 and I'm still discussing it today and sadly we have made no progress or the progress that we've made seems that we have gone taken many many step back steps backwards in this and so it's these these are three areas that I discuss that I think are so very important for my students and so continue to discuss them um, but there are I've always seen ethics as this vehicle that moves across all these disciplines. And that's why Ethics Across the Curriculum was such a fun grant for me to get from uh, FIPSI. And I was able to get two more grants from FIPSI to disseminate Ethics Across the Curriculum and also to start a society, the Society for Ethics Across the Curriculum and a journal called Teaching Ethics. So we have now been uh, running our organization for 21 years, and it's really not in competition to Appy. It's a kind of a boutique uh, uh, area, and we have about 120 members, and we really enjoy getting together. Once again, a group of people who are just crazy talking about ethics and um, uh, wanting to network with one another. We want to share our focuses, uh, what we've learned. Our last conference was at Villanova on race and justice. I felt like I was 10 years behind the times. These uh, 
presentations and discussions were so good and our keynote speakers were so strong that it really inspired me to do a lot more in making sure my students understand the relevance of justice and equality uh, and that they're not just throwaway words but they're things that we really need to be doing. So those are a few of the areas. I've also loved uh, working in media ethics. Most of the books that I've written are in media ethics. So some in interpersonal communication, organizational communication, or um, mass media. And I've also enjoyed writing books in business ethics and um, engineering ethics with my husband, Mike Pritchard. This is it's a wonderful overview and a little bit of a future casting on the race and equality and justice questions. If you were going to turn and look at the next 40 years, what issues do you think will remain? Are there new issues on the horizon that you think ethicists will be grappling with? Um, I think that technology will bring a lot of new issues that ethicists should be grappling with. But I also don't think that some of these old issues will go away. We need to have a concerted focus on um, raci racial justice, on diversity and inclusion. And if we don't talk about it, we'll find ourselves right back in the same spot where we are right now with uh, reproductive rights for women. So it's amazing to me how things can slide backward just when we have become complacent and we think that they're going to be moving forward. But there are these other exciting areas that we can look at, such as drones and artificial intelligence and lethal artificial intelligence, and are they autonomous and could they take off on their own? Uh, we talk about uh, the self-driving cars. Uh, we talk about Boeing 737 MAX, which is a huge disappointment to many of us who study ethics and engineering, because here we had a beautiful airplane, the 737, and instead of engineering this properly, following their scientific and ethical and engineering codes, they just kind of retrofitted this terrific plane with uh, parts that weren't going to work well with it or that needed uh, a, a, an extra um, bump or sensor from a pilot. And they didn't give proper training. We've had two fatal crashes. So just when we think that probably in an area where we were doing great, uh, all it took was a, a span of five months to find out how defective this airline is, this airliner is, and what are they going to do about that fleet, and uh, what will this, this uh, business giant do? Uh, can it be brought down by this mistake? So there are lots of fun issues for the future that we need to talk about and that are interesting and um, innovative. But some of these others that we think um, may have gone away, I don't think they've really gone away. Uh, we, we need to keep our eye focused on them. When I started attending Appy, Brian Shrug was the director. And he was so good and kind. And it seemed like he immediately got to know each one of us by name, and he knew our specialty areas. He introduced us to people. He introduced me to Lisa Newton. He introduced me to Anya Donovan, to um, more people than I can even imagine. And I think we see some of those very same attributes happening now with Appy, where we have uh, Gretchen Winter, who's our, our past president, and she's introduced me to so many uh, vital topics and individuals and I think that I will continue going to Appy every year for as long as I'm able because I like meeting people who are as crazy about ethics as I am. <laughs> Can I ask one very quick question? Yes. What's the difference between Appy and say the SBE or some of the other organizations? There's something specifically different about it. Um, what I find different about Appy and other organizations such as SBE or even uh, SCAC is that um, Appy is pulling a larger number of diverse um, professionals. So we'll have folks from um, who are in bioethics. They might be medical personnel. They might be researchers. 
Um, they might be people who are studying uh, the Human Genome Project and CRISPR. Uh, and then we'll get folks in law. And um, besides folks in law, then we'll have specialty areas in engineering, in media ethics. So um, especially in the last um, maybe eight years or so, Appy has made um, a, a move to say, okay, how are we going to specialize in all these areas? So we can still be a generalist when we come to the conferences. We can still go to whatever talk we'd like to. Um, but we can also say, oh, here's a specialty. Um, here's a specialty area. These are where folks that I often read about or read their works and would like to know more about them. This is, these are the sessions where I'll find them. So that's one of the major differences uh, with API is some, you know, they've done some of this good specialization work. I would heard about API from Denny Elliott and API had just started and she said, you must come to API. And so I believe I've attended every single API meeting except for the very first one. I wasn't in the very first planning meeting. But, um, F, F, but Denny was at that meeting, and she could get me to the next one, and she did. I think that year there were six of us who received grants in ethics from FIPSI, and um, it's a really hard grant to get, by the way. But there were six of us, and half of us ended up joining NAPI, so, and I think we've stayed on. So. You deserve a lot of comments on the cake next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>